Good afternoon and welcome to the Medical College of Wisconsin's Coffee Conversations with Scientists. I'm your host, Raina Andrews. And for those of you just tuning in for the first time, let me introduce myself. I'm a mother, a children's book author, a public health advocate, and an engaged community member. I'm your host for the 2023 Coffee Conversations with Scientists series. So for those of you just tuning in, tuning in, Coffee Conversations is brought to you by the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, which is a statewide nonprofit working to improve health and advance health equity in Wisconsin. Since early in 2021, we have been sharing the science behind today's most important health topics. Today, we are covering a very timely topic as summertime is near and the race to get our beach bodies together is on. Whether you stuck to your New Year's resolution to be a healthier you or lose weight, some are really turning to a silver bullet in fat dieting to reach their summer goals. So to, gov to, to really cover this topic, today's special guest is Dr. Lisa Morselli, who is an endocrinologist and assistant professor at Freighter in the Medical College of Wisconsin. Welcome, Dr. Morselli. Thank you, Raina. It's great to be here. Yes, yes. So we will be covering a great list of questions on the trends, facts, and misconceptions associated with effective dieting and possibly dispel some of the type, really hype around questionable fad diets. So I encourage all of you watching to drop any questions you have on the topic into the comment section below on our live stream here. We'll be getting to as many of these questions as possible today. So let's get started, okay? So, Dr. Marcelli, I'm so excited that you're here today. I'm I'm really curious, what exactly is an endocrinologist? An endocrinologist is a doctor who specializes in hormone issues. Um, and most commonly, we take care of diabetes and thyroid issues, but there are other uh, endocrine glands that make hormones in the body, like the adrenal glands, the pituitary gland, um, the parathyroids who control calcium levels in the blood. And then we all often take care of weight issues too, because not really because um, weight issues are driven by hormone abnormalities, although sometimes it happens, but uh, just because weight itself has an impact on certain hormones and is associated with diabetes. And so I really want to unpack what you do as an endocrinologist so that our audience can really appreciate your depth of knowledge and really the science of studying how hormones affects our ability to lose weight. And, and I think you would probably have a really good idea on the prevalence of obesity in our country. So can we just talk about, I mean, it seems like obesity has just skyrocketed and it's at an all time high, especially from COVID and with sediment lifestyles and the fast food industry on the, on the rise. So what does the data really tell us about the prevalence and the causes of obesity in America? So let me share um, a slide that I have here that will illustrate this. Um, so unfortunately, you're right that uh, the prevalence of obesity, the rates of obesity have increased a lot over the last few decades in the US, but also worldwide. And here I'm showing you uh, maps that report um, the rates of obesity by state in different years over the last decade, uh, the last, last two decades, really. And you can see in the first map, there are some states that are green and some that are yellow, some that are orange. The green ones are where the ones with the lowest prevalence of obesity. Mm -hmm. And as we got progressively towards 2021, you can see that the green has disappeared from the map and there are uh, more and more dark orange or red states. Yeah. And uh, that's a sign. Uh, I think that illustrates really well how the rates have increased over time. And so right now, um, the most recent estimates are that 42% of US adults, so over four in 10 adults, are uh, have obesity. And the prediction for 2050 is that half of the US adult population will have obesity. Oh my goodness. What do you think? And, okay. What do you think the cause of the rise of this has been? Well, there are, uh, really obesity is a multifactorial condition, meaning that there are many factors that contribute to it. And so, um, let me just unshare. Okay. Um, the, the, there's definitely an impact of genetic background and genetic predisposition, but then we're uh, exposed to a food environment that promote, promotes uh intake of large amounts of foods and foods that are not healthy. Uh, we are less active than in the past. 
We take medications that can make people gain weight, um, sleep issues, stress. There are many things that contribute uh, to the raising, rising rates of obesity in this country. Right. So it sounds like people are fa falling to this vicious cycle of obesity that, I mean, is, mm -hmm. is, is a huge indicator and a gateway to other chronic illness. But some people are, are looking for that silver bullet to get out of it in fad dieting. Can you just define for us what is a fad diet? So fat diet is a diet that becomes popular over a short, relatively short period of time. It's usually not actually based in science, and it typically promises uh, great results with minimal efforts and does not lead to long-lasting weight loss. Okay. And there's really uh, many more fat diets than I would know about. But um, What are some examples? Yeah, one example that I... Uh, that stuck to me that my patients told me about is the cabbage diet, where you can eat only cabbage for a week and then you're promised to lose 10 pounds over that uh, period of time. I mean, just eating cabbage, I could see where you'd lose a lot of weight if that's all you're yes. eating. Yes, yes. So you can lose weight, but it's not the healthy way of losing weight and it's not long, long lasting. What about this HCG diet that, that I've seen a lot of people lose weight with? So uh, HCG diet is a diet in which you receive uh, HCG, a hormone that is made by normally by the placenta during pregnancy, and you follow a very low calorie meal plan. And really, there's no evidence that HCG curbs appetite, which is what the proponents of this diet say. So you lose weight because you eat uh, very small amounts of food. Uh, but there's no, uh, this is was based on one study, I think, published in the 1970s. And really, the results of this study have, have not been replicated. Uh, so definitely that's what I would call a fat diet. Got it. So like, what is this? Um, the Mediterranean diet, that's not considered a fat diet, is it? No, that's actually a, a healthful um, type of meal plan where uh, the types of foods, there are not really many uh, foods that are restricted and it's just a matter of eating uh, whole foods and um, healthy fats in moderation. So in moderation, so the key between um, a fad diet and just a healthy lifestyle is a fad diet will have you it, it, really starve yourself with a, a, an extreme decrease in calories, but also it's not proven in science and it's not really sustainable. Is exactly. that exactly. Yes. And exactly. so I'm, I'm going to ask you something that I've heard a lot of people swear by, but I, I think that you may have some caution behind this. So Ozempic has been in the news recently for its popularity as a weight loss solution, which isn't its primary purpose. So is taking Ozempic, a similar drug to lose weight, a good idea? So first I want to say that um, you know, Ozempic is uh, technically approved for diabetes and not for weight loss, mm -hmm. but doctors use of uh, of drugs off-label all the time and it's not necessarily a bad thing as long as there is evidence that the drug works for the condition it is used to. So um, Ozempic is a drug called semaglutide which as I said is approved for diabetes but the same drug at a higher dose at a higher dose has been approved for weight loss under the name Wegovy. Mm -hmm. and um, these drugs semaglutide really uh, helps people lose weight because it curbs hunger by acting on the brain centers that control appetite. And Wigovi became so very- It works on the brain's brain to control appetite. Is that where people are no longer hungry? Like, does it help them not feel hungry? Yes. Okay. It helps decrease hunger and it makes people feel full for longer. So then obviously that leads to uh, eating less food. Got it. And smaller portions. Mm -hmm. So um, Wegovy became really popular uh, when it was first approved in 2021 because it was very effective. Um, and unfortunately, the manufacturer had some production issues, so it became unavailable pretty quickly. And uh, so because it's the same medication as Ozempic, providers turned to Ozempic as an alternative, uh, thinking that this shortage wouldn't last very long. But unfortunately, the shortage extended for over a year. And then the issue snowballed to other similar drugs that are used for diabetes that also cause weight loss. Mm -hmm. And then the issue was further compounded by the fact that some celebrities shared their success with this drug. 
and then it became even more popular and it was viewed as a quick fix i think by many people which is it is not actually Mm -hmm. um and so now there's actually um there are many companies or spas that offer compounded semaglutide for cash price and uh, we don't really know where these compounded versions come from because it's still under patent and so my recommendation is to stay away from these non-fda approved versions because we don't know if they are safe so so what is this new version that people should be looking out for it's called compounded semaglutide or compounded ozempic it's basically semaglutide that is not made by the manufacturer but but it's in synthetic it's it's it's, it's, it's either made with uh, uh semaglutide that is used for research and then reconstituted in vials or yeah no, i'm not sure where else it comes from but this is actually a question that many endocrinologists then uh weight management providers ask themselves because it's not supposed to come from anywhere else than the drug company so people who are turning to ozempic at to really help them manage weight well first of all who do you think would be a candidate i mean if i need to lose 10 pounds maybe not but anything over like 25 50 would would, would so there's that? really um so we based um um the decision to start a medication for weight loss in general on a person's weight relating to their height. So it's, we use the metric BMI, mm -hmm. uh, which I know is not a perfect measure, but that's what we use in uh, clinical practice. And then uh, the presence of uh, um, other conditions related to uh, excess weight. So that the, this is the, so I can tell you really uh um you know a weight amount that people sh um, should lose to qualify to should need to lose to qualify for this type of medication but definitely if you're a person who needs to lose five pounds you don't need to five or ten pounds you don't need uh, a medication to help you with that in most cases so this this weight weight loss drug there's shots that people will give mm -hmm. themselves correct so yeah. it, it it is effective. People are losing weight. However, what is the caution behind it? Why should people think twice before pursuing it? Well, uh, like most drugs, um, there are you know uh, risks and benefits, um, and there are side effects. Most most side effects are uh, mild, but um, this medication can cause nausea. It can cause constipation or other digestive issues. Um, and the the I think one thing that people don't necessarily understand is that these medications are th are thought to um, are meant to be taken in the long term. So again, they're not a quick fix. Um, and I think we hear in the media that now people who stop taking these medications have more hunger and more cravings. This is not something specific to Ozempic. It happens with any medication that suppresses appetite, any medication that um, makes you less hungry when you stop taking it. It's not that you've uh, the medication cured your hunger or or appetite forever. So mm -hmm. once this once you stop taking the medication, the effect obviously wanes, and then you become more hungry and you regain weight. And so, so mm -hmm. no, go ahead. Sorry, that's a very important note. It's like. With, with dieting, it's how you start is how you need to finish. And if you're taking a, a shot to lose weight and you don't have that behavioral change that's necessary, you'll have to continue taking it or that weight will come back. And unfortunately, the weight may come back even if you uh, you have changed your lifestyle a little bit, because again, there are some it's some biological mechanisms that the medication uh, toned down that are revved up once you stop taking the medication. And so historically, I think people have viewed weight loss and weight loss medication medications as a short term solution. But really now uh, most uh, the medical field thinks that obesity is a chronic condition. So it's a long lasting condition. Mm -hmm. And it um, that's why, like, for example, high blood pressure, if you take a blood pressure medication it's not that you stop it once your blood pressure normalizes because if you stop it your blood pressure will go right back up so same thing with medications that control appetite mm -hmm. you should take them in the long term got it well dr marcella i told you that this would be a very popular episode because we have a lot of comments in the chat so we're going to turn to our audience now okay yeah. 
Okay. So uh, on the on the point of Wagovi, one of the the comments is, what about Wagovi? Can an endocrinologist help you get approved for this through insurance? So, um, it all depends if your insurance covers this drug. If um, there are unfortunately many insurances who don't cover any weight loss drug, or um, who have you know, restrictive, restrictive criteria for who can take this type of uh, medication. So we can try, but our, sometimes our hands are tied. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. However, if someone is a diabetic and they um, are prescribed Ozempic, that can maybe be covered by insurance, do you think? Yes, again, it depends on what uh, what is on the insurance formulary. But I always think that, unfortunately, having diabetes gives you an advantage because then it opens the door to many more uh, quite effective medications that treat both diabetes and weight issues. Yes. Yeah, which is well, sad. Because... Are you familiar with these keto gummies? Because this is the next question. It says, could you comment on the keto gummies um, that celebrities have used to lose weight? If you stop taking it, do you gain the weight back? Have you heard of this? So first of all, I want to say that in my in my opinion and many uh, weight management provider, providers' opinion, um, there's very little evidence that any weight loss supplement really works. Mm -hmm. And that's because these supplements are not tested um, extensively like drugs um, before they get on the market and really um, this is an industry that is not regulated, so there's um, the the manufacturers don't are not obligated to list all the ingredients that they put in the supplements, and uh, sometimes there can be harmful ingredients, and sometimes there's the in ingredients, the active ingredients that are listed are not in the supplement. When you know there's been studies that have shown that or where the supplement has been analyzed. But uh, regarding the um, keto gummies, so mm -hmm. ke keto diet, I think there is some uh, evidence that it it causes weight loss. I don't know that it's more effective than watching your portions or um, other types of diets. Really, there's, uh, there's no evidence that there's one type of diet that works better than others mm -hmm. because there's a lot of... Um, it's very variable how people respond to a one diet. So um, there are some people for whom keto is very effective and some people for whom it's just watching your calories that is very effective or um, yeah, portion control in general or intermittent fasting. It really depends. Okay. Uh, but in, in regard to these keto gummies, as far as I know, taking ketones, because that's what they are, mm -hmm. um, doesn't doesn't have any benefit. What is a ketone? The ketone is a substance that the body makes when there's not enough insulin around, um, and it's um, it comes from uh, fat. So the body is able to when there's not insulin around and insulin uh, to release uh, sugar um in the bloodstream then the body turns to fats um to produce these ketones which can be used as an energy source for the brain and other organs mm -hmm. you mean you just mentioned intermittent fasting yes. um is that is that safe is that a safe way to lose weight as long as you have a balanced diet Mm -hmm. uh, where you don't, you know, are not deficient in certain nutrients. It can be a way of losing weight um, because what studies have shown is that people end up restricting or de decreasing the amount of food that they eat. Mm -hmm. But again, it doesn't work for everybody. So you need to um, really, when you're trying to lose weight and changing your eating habits, you need to figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. And so as you talk about these fads, we talk about intermittent fasting. Some people are like, oh, drink just, just drink some apple cider vinegar. Have you heard anything about that one? Is that considered like a fad? Yes, that is considered a fad. Okay, so apple cider vinegar doesn't help you lose weight or curb your appetite? I think the evidence is very limited. And, you know, depending on if you, it's probably not harmful if you uh, drink a small amount 
but uh, as vinegar is acid, so then you can have some uh, burns in your feeding pipe or in your mouth if you drink too much of it. And so I think um, my opinion is to that people should really people should not look for this kind of quick fixes, but just try to um, nourish their body to back to health with real foods that are available. Well, that, that's a perfect segue for this next um, viewer's question. They're asking, besides weight loss medication, what do you suggest for a good framework for weight loss without medication? So definitely um, you need to change your eating habits in some way. And again, uh, I usually um, ask my patients um, extensive questions about what they eat and what they've tried in the past. and to try to understand what would make more sense for them. Uh, then the other very important uh, aspect of weight loss is regular exercise. And um, that's in part because you want to create a calorie deficit. So you want to burn more energy than what you take in with food. But the other very important reason to exercise regularly is that if you just cut back on what you eat, you will lose weight, but you will lose muscle and not fat which is not the healthy way of losing weight. The number on the scale will be lower, but that's, uh, you're not achieving better health in a way. Got it. So I think these are the, the two components and then making sure you get enough sleep because sleep has uh, a big influence on our appetite and on your, our weight. Um, have, asking your doctor to take a look at your what medications you're taking because there are many medications that promote weight gain or make it harder to lose weight and sometimes we don't always have good alternatives that don't affect weight as much but there's sometimes there are and then um yeah, the, these are my recommendations in general for non uh medication for weight loss without medication Mm -hmm. And the food that you eat, make sure it's minimally processed, right? Yes, yes. because huge. there's unfortunately we're surrounded with highly processed foods, and there are studies that have studies that have shown that these types of food uh, foods promote overeating. Yes. So going back to real foods, oh. that's really important. Yes. Well, Dr. Marcelli, this is a really big question. Being um, an endocrinologist who really deals in hormones, um, I'm going to break this down into sections. So a number of listeners are asking, how do our hormones affect our ability to lose weight? And they're specifically asking about endometriosis, menopause, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and um, thyroid conditions. How do these hormonal um, issues challenge our ability to lose weight. So I'll start with the thyroid issues mm -hmm. uh, because the thyroid is blamed often for weight issues. And it's true that thyroid hormones are very important for uh, metabolism. If And if you have low thyroid hormone levels, your metabolism will be slower. However, the thing to consider is that for your, um, for the underactive thyroid, to actually have an impact on your weight, your thyroid hormone levels need to be profoundly low. Okay. Um, and if you are on an adequate um, dose of thyroid medication mm -hmm. and your thyroid levels are normal, that should not affect your ability to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Because you're like a normal a person who has a normal thyroid and a normal metabolism. Right. So mix that out as your reason. It's you. Yeah. It's you. Some, it's your diet. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's not, it, it's not, it's, I don't want to say it's you, it's your diet, but what I can say is that it really takes profoundly abnormal thyroid function for it to have an, a significant impact on metabolism and weight. Got it. The, um, I think you asked me about the polycystic ovarian the PCOS. Mm -hmm. uh, so in women with PCOS, we know that they are at higher risk of weight gain mm -hmm. and they may have more difficulty losing weight. And I don't think we know exactly for sure what triggers the weight gain, but one thing is that they, they are prone to is insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And insulin resistance is a condition in which um, 
insulin, which is the hormone that we make to process sugar, um, has a hard time doing its job. And, norm and its job is to push sugar into the cells. And so when we, when uh, insulin has a hard time doing its job, it cannot push the sugar inside the liver cell, the muscle cells, the heart cells, etc. But it still can push it inside the fat cells. And so sugar basically gets turned into fat, and then that leads to fat growth, and then that leads to more insulin resistance, and it's like a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, in this case also, there's a more there's a greater impact of this hormone on on our weight in the right. in women and, with PCOS. And doesn't matters get worse? Like the it's difficult to lose weight. But the more weight that you gain, the worse your situation becomes. Is yes, that yes, that's what I mean by a vicious circle. It's it's a feed forward circle. So, so, so women who are menopausal or premenopausal, how you know your hormones are a little all over. So um, the female hormones, estrogen, um, is a hormone that tends to decrease appetite, and so after menopause, because the estrogen levels go down. Uh, women can have an increase in appetite. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that happens with menopause is that uh, women often don't get good sleep because they have hot flashes at night. Mm -hmm. And as I said, sleep has a big impact on um, our weight, in part because uh, if you don't sleep enough, you'll be hungrier, you'll crave more uh, starchy and fatty foods, mm -hmm. and then you'll be more tired. So that will also interfere with your activity. Okay. And then so, the last one was endometriosis. So endometriosis, I am not aware that there are hormone abnormalities, uh, major hormone abnormalities that cause endometriosis. It's just it's a condition in which there's abnormal, the, the lining of the uterus is pre present in other uh, locations where it shouldn't be. And because the lining of the uterus, anywhere it is, uh, wherever it is, responds to the female hormone and during the menstrual cycle um, then that causes issues and pain but i'm not aware mm -hmm. uh, that there's a, a link with uh, with weight in this situation got it i mean we have a very active chat room here so i'm going to ask two more questions and we'll do your rapid round okay sure. so the next question is someone's asking about diet soda it's like when i drink diet soda does that really affect um uh weight loss does it affect um insulin so I, it shouldn't affect insulin, but there's really pros and cons to diet soda. Mm -hmm. The pros is that the, the good thing about diet soda is that it has no calories. So if you're a person who switches from drinking a lot of regular soda to a lot uh, uh, to diet soda, that will make a huge, that can make a huge difference. But um, artificial sweeteners have, um, are much more, are much sweeter than regular sugar. And so when you drink a lot of uh, uh, diet soda, your brain gets used to this very sweet taste, and then it becomes insensitive, less sensitive to lower uh, sweetness, a lower level of sweetness, and then you it makes you crave sweets. So oh. again, it, what I recommend to my patients is to try to stay away from artificially sweetened beverages as much as possible. If you drink one so diet soda a day, it's probably not going to affect things too much, but really it's better to stick to water. Yeah, uh, because it sounds like and you avoiding calories from this one drink, yeah. you're increasing the, the, the probability of you having the calories yes. and cravings. Yes, oh from other sources. Yeah. So the, the last question here, and, and there are far more, but the last that we'll ask on air here is, how do you measure insulin resistance? You m mentioned this earlier on in the show. We don't measure it. I mean, we measure it in the research um, setting, but not in clinical, in clinical practice. We can see uh, in some people, there are some, we can see signs of insulin resistance. Um, often people with insulin resistance have a thickening and possibly darkening of the skin on the neck, on the back of the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a condition called acantosis nigricans. So that's a sign of insulin resistance. 
And we can also see it indirectly in people who, for example, have prediabetes because insulin resistance is a condition that leads to prediabetes. And there are studies that show that a good proportion of uh, people who are overweight have some degree of insulin resistance, okay. even if it doesn't manifest as prediabetes. So what does it mean to really be insulin resistant? What, what is happening in your body? So when you're insulin resistant, um, basically, as I said the, earlier, the insulin, which is the hormone that pushes sugar inside the cells, mm -hmm. cannot do its job. And um, instead of pushing sugar inside uh, the liver cells, the muscle cells, etc., it ends up having to push sugar inside fat cells, and that leads to fat growth. But over time, um, insulin resistance uh, leads to prediabetes because the way the body tries to compensate for insulin resistance is by making more insulin. And then over time, uh, the pancreas gets tired. Mm. The pancreas is the organ that makes insulin. So it gets tired and it cannot keep up. And that's when the blood sugar starts rising. Wow. So uh, we could be talking about this all day, Dr. Morselli. So just really quick, last question with the wrap around here. So what are the top three myths about dieting you'd like to address with us today? So the first is that, uh, the first myth is that you can um, weight loss uh, fast, it was lose weight fast, sorry. There's no quick fix for quick fix for weight loss. And quick weight loss is usually followed by uh, rapid weight regain. And that's why I always talk about to my patients about how weight loss is a journey. And really the main thing to focus on is long-term sustainability. It's never easy to change our eating habits, but if it's extremely difficult, then you're not going to be able to do it for a long period of time or the rest of your life. And so it's probably um, better to look for another solution. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also important to have realistic weight loss goals and people don't, uh, often don't realize that relatively small weight loss in the order of five to 10%, which means for a person who weighs 250 pounds, anywhere from 12 to 25 pounds. So this, this amount of weight loss can lead to, can lead to significant improvement in your health. And then although more weight loss can lead to greater health improvement, focusing on how you feel rather than the number on the scale, that's a good thing too. And, and so we don't need to be focused necessarily so much on the numbers, uh, but we should also feel, uh, reflect on how we feel after even a relatively small amount of weight loss. Yeah. And then the last uh, myth that I'd like to address is uh, that you have to go to the gym every day to lose weight. So as I mentioned earlier, it's important to exercise regularly when you're trying to lose weight because you want to keep your muscles healthy, but it doesn't need to happen in the gym. And really, again, the important thing is to find an activity that you enjoy because then you'll be more likely to continue to uh, perform this activity in the long run. Mm -hmm. And if you have conditions that limit your ability to exercise, you can you should take it slow and maybe talk with your doctor about strategies to limit pain or improve your breathing mm -hmm. things like that wow those those are really helpful tips and i mean i i was one of the ones that think i have to go to the gym every day but it, it seems like mainly what you put in your mouth your diet is the biggest supporter in us being able to lose yes. weight and, and maintaining that healthy lifestyle yes. mm -hmm. and i think you may have read or heard uh, the sentence that you cannot over exercise a bad diet so that's true. Yeah. So you need to work on both aspect, both sides of the uh, energy balance scale. You need mm -hmm. to watch what you eat and try to increase your activity. Yeah. That's, yeah. I always say be fueled, be fit, and be focused. So with that, Dr. Marcelli, I know I asked, that was the last question, but there's this one that's really pulsating in the back of my mind that one of our audience members, do you mind if we, I just ask you one more sure. question? Sure. And so someone's saying, if I have a lot of weight to lose and I'm going in this vicious cycle, like you described, at what point should I consider bariatric surgery? And what point should I um, consider one of these, these, these medications such as Wachovia? I think um, you need to have a conversation with your doctor, mm -hmm. uh, but definitely if you um, 
if you have tried in the past uh, with changing your lifestyle and haven't had much success, that's a moment, that's the time to consider definitely medications. And then depending on the amount of weight that you need to lose, bariatric surgery is a good option. It's definitely a life-changing surgery, so it's not for everyone, but um, it is definitely the weight loss intervention that will allow you to lose the most weight and more importantly, will allow you to keep it off for the most part, if you, if you follow the recommendations um, for eating and exercise after the surgery. But that's a diff that's a, a conversation that you need to have with your doctor, and you can ask uh, your doctor because unfortunately many primary care doctors don't really have time to address these types of issues. Uh, you can ask for a referral to a weight management specialist. Got it. Well, with that, I want to thank you, Dr. Morcelli, for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to really talk to us about this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. This was uh, my pleasure. Thanks. And for those of you out in the interwebs viewing us online, if we did not get your question, I know I didn't answer all of them, please send us a message, a little note at conversations at mcw.edu. So I hope you all join us next month for a virtual coffee break and a conversation with a scientist. Have a great day.